Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Brinda Ki Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopi Nath Shtam Kundra Ghat Kundgiri Govardhan Ki Sri Brinda Vam Dham Ki Navadvi Maya Pur Dham Ki Jagannath Puri Dham Ki Nu Brinda Vam Ki Ganga Mai Ki Yamuna Mai Ki Bhakti Devi Ki तुलसी देवी की समवेद भक्त ब्रिंद की गोप विमान अंधेरी ऑफ ग्लोरी स्तुति संधि ऑफ ग्लोरी स्तुति संधि ऑफ ग्लोरी स्तुति संधि ऑफ ग्लोरी स्तुति श्री गुरु एंड श्री गोरा Himself, how shall I go alone to the Vaikuntha planet 
and leave behind my poor mother. Dhruva had a feeling of obligation to his mother, Suniti. It was Suniti who had given him the clue which, was not, which had now enabled him to be personally carried to the Vaikuntha planet by the associates of Lord Vishnu. He now remembered her and wanted to take her with him. Actually, Juva Maharaja's mother, Suniti, was his Pata Pradarshaka Guru. Pata Pradarshaka Guru means the Guru or the spiritual master who shows the way. Such a Guru is sometimes called Shiksha Guru. Although Nara Muni was his Diksha Guru, initiating the spiritual master, Suniti, his mother, was the first who gave him instruction on how to achieve the favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is the duty of the Shiksha Guru or Diksha Guru to instruct the disciple in the right way, and it depends on the disciple to execute the process. According to Shastric injunctions, there is no difference between Shiksha Guru and Diksha Guru. And generally, the Shiksha Guru later becomes the Diksha Guru. Suniti, however, being a woman, and specifically his mother, could not become Dhruva Maharaja's Diksha Guru. Still, he was not less obliged to Suniti. There was no question of carrying Narada Muni to Vaikuntha Loka, but Dhruva Maharaj thought of his mother. Whatever plan the Supreme Personality of Godhead contemplates immediately fructifies. Similarly, a devotee who is completely dependent upon the Supreme Lord can also fulfill his wishes by the grace of the Lord. The Lord fulfills his wishes independently, but a devotee fulfills his wishes simply by being dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, as soon as Dhruva Maharaj thought of his poor mother, he was assured by the associates of Vishnu that Suniti was also going to Vaikuntha Loka in another plane. Dhruva Maharaj had thought that he was going alone to Vaikuntha, leaving behind his mother, which was not very auspicious because people would criticize him for going alone to Vaikuntha Loka and not carrying with him Suniti, who had given him so much. But Dhruva also considered that he was not personally the Supreme. Therefore, if Krishna fulfilled his desires, only then would it be possible. Krishna immediately understood his mind and he told Dhruva that his mother was also going with him. This incident proves that a pure devotee like Dhruva Maharaj can fulfill all his desires by the grace of the Lord and become exactly like the Lord. And thus, whenever he thinks of anything, his wish is immediately. Sāvatūtam parīcana 
scholar asked Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu of the nine processes of devotional service which is most important. And Lord Chaitanya immediately responded, Kirtana, the chanting of the Holy Names. And Srila Prabhupada explained to us that we should learn to chant the Holy Names with the feeling of a child in desperation calling for its mother, forgetting some of these special effects you classed. <laughs> if we analyze that carefully, it's a very profound statement. Why, when a child is in danger, she or he cries out for mother. I'm speaking of a baby child. The baby doesn't cry for brothers or sisters. <laughs> for the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> for the police or the fire department. <laughs> doesn't even call for father. Naturally, spontaneously cries for mother. Which is a natural revelation of the nature of a mother's love. A 
say mother's love is hopeless. A good mother. There's all kinds of mothers, but we're talking about a mother mother. <laughs>
Srila Prabhupada would explain on Janmashtami that whenever we take shelter of Krishna remembering him, he's taking birth in our hearts. Janmashtami, Gorapurima. There are days when we really focus to establish that consciousness by which we're really conscious of Krishna every day. Mother's Day is a day to remind us how every day we should appreciate the selfless loving service of mothers. And within our Vaishnava tradition, the position of mother is glorified and worshipped as being so sacred. There are innumerable examples, prominent stories to reveal the sacredness of motherhood to us. In today's verse we're reading about Dhruva Maharaj, how he appreciated his mother's selfless love. We read the story in the fourth cat of, of how little Dhruva was just five years old and he wanted to be with his father. He saw his father sitting on the throne playing with his stepbrother, Bhutta. And they were having such a nice experience together. And Dhruva Maharaj wanted to do that also. He wanted to join them. He began to crawl up to his father's lap with his brother. But the stepmother, Suruchi, she could not tolerate seeing this. She screamed at Drew. <coughs> you have no right to be on your father's throne or lap because you have not been born of my womb. Because you are born of an inferior woman, you cannot sit with your father. If you want to do so, you must worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then, if He is pleased with you, you can take your next birth in my womb, and then you will be entitled to this position. Little Drew, at that point, had only one shelter. He was deeply wounded. He looked to his father, Uttanapada, his father, because of his excessive attachment to Suruchi, he looked away. He said nothing and did nothing. Little Dhruva, his tiny heart felt totally betrayed. He was heaving like a snake that was just beaten with a stick. And he ran to his mother. What other shelter did he have? When his mother, Suniti, saw him in this condition, she lovingly put Dhruva on her lap. Dhruva was crying grievously. He was breathing so heavy. Tears were pouring from his eyes. His lips and his limbs were trembling. He was speechless. When Saluti saw her child in this condition, total suffering, she asked what happened. And some of the people of the palace told her exactly what the stepmother said. Saluti's pain was multiplied many times more than Jerusalem. It's the nature of a mother's love. It's the nature of love. The pain of a loved one inflicts the heart even deeper than any pain that could come to ourselves. She felt like she was burning like a dried leaf in a blazing forest fire of grief. Cried. And she said to Shruva, 
never wish anything inauspicious to anyone. Because if you want something inauspicious to have anyone to, to come upon anyone else, that will only cause you pain. <coughs> Do not be envious. Do not be angry. Because actually what your stepmother Suruchi said is good advice. You should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because the Supreme Lord is very kind to his devotees and will fulfill all of his devotees' deepest desires. By worshiping the Supreme Lord, you can be freed forever from the cycle of birth and death and attain liberation from all suffering. Your great grandfather, Brahma, by worshiping the Supreme Lord, he attained the powers to create an entire universe. Your grandfather, Swayamuvamanu, by his worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he attained all material prosperity in this life and attained liberation after. In this stage, Ruva Maharaj, I am helpless. You are helpless. Everyone is helpless. Only the Supreme Lord, only Krishna can save you. Worship the Lord. By remembering Him within your heart, offering your prayers and surrendering your, your life. This is the path all the great souls have followed. Dhruva Maharaj took her words very seriously far more than she or anyone else expected. He immediately left home and went to the forest. And we all know the story. And the story. Because he was so determined, Drita Vrata, the Lord who was in the heart sent Naramuni to be his guru and taught him how to chant the holy names and worship the Lord. And in just a few months, he attained the perfection of the grace. He came back to become the king. When he came back, his father and everybody, they were so aggrieved by his leaving that they gave him the throne. And he ruled for many, many years. The story took place in Sakti Yuga. Of years. And after he performed his duties for the Lord and for all the citizens, he went to Padre Dasha to end his life completely immersed in devotional service in Sadhana. At that time, an airplane from Vaikuntha came to bring Dhruva to the spiritual world. Dhruva Maharaj was so humble and so sincere, so exemplary, that he went to all the other sages and touched their feet and begged their permission and blessings. Now that's interesting. Because the plane wasn't coming for them. He could have said, I don't know what's happening with you. <laughs> I have attained perfection. <laughs> Always humble respect. Bow down to each sage, to the blessings from them. And then he performed his sadhana that day. He completed his daily activities of devotional service. In other words, sadhana at the beginning stages is tapasya. It's the means by which we become purified. 
the Prabhupada, he was asked, what do you expect to get out of this chanting of Hare Krishna? Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> now we're chanting to clean our hearts, but once our hearts are clean, then we will chant an ecstatic love of God, because we will take Krishna, Krishna who's not different than his name. Rupa Goswami said, the two syllables, Krishna, when I chant, I wish many, many, many tongues for Krishna to dance upon. And when it enters into my ears, I desire millions and millions and millions of years. And when it enters into my heart, it conquers my entire being. This is what it's like to chant in a perfect state. The Drupal set an example. He performed a sadhana. Then he boarded the plane. As he was boarding, he stepped on the head of death personified. He used death, the ultimate power of the material creation that everyone fears so much, whoever you are. He considered death to be an insignificant step to put his head on to board the plane. <laughs> death gratefully accepted through his focus. Now he was on the plane and he was about to take off to the spiritual world. And he thought of his mother. Such appreciation. She gave him this advice about 30,000 years before. <laughs> but he never forgot it. This is the nature of a great person. Gratitude. Without gratitude, the seed of devotion cannot really take strong roots within our heart. And a tree of bhakti cannot grow properly. And that gratitude becomes deeper and greater as we make spiritual advancement. Prabhupada so often quoted this verse. Even when the most difficult circumstances, the most painful conditions, even the most unjust situations come upon us, if we can just be grateful to Krishna for the opportunity to take shelter and surrender to Him, that alone will give you the right to attain the perfection of liberation. Grateful heart. So Dhruva was remembering his mother with such gratitude. And he was feeling, I can't go without her. Because it's only because of her that I, that I took to the path of devotion. She didn't teach him that much. She just taught a few verses. Zara Muni, his guru, told him all the rest. But those few verses put him in a direction. And every mother devotee the child in that direction. <coughs> and he looked up and saw his mother was on another plane going to my group. In front of him. Because the Lord understood his heart. And Sri Prabhupada, in his great humility, in this chapter, he explains that he is praying that one of his disciples or some of his disciples, even one, will become like Dhruva Maharaj so that when that disciple prays, it will, he, he will get to go back to God. <laughs> that is the nature of a great Vaisha. Such humility. Such gratitude. When Lord Chaitanya is about to take to sannyas, his mother found out about this. It was unbearable. And she approached Lord Chaitanya in a secluded place and asked him. And Lord Chaitanya told her in great detail the 
Jackson described in Chaitanya Mungo, the story of Trumpa Maharaj. <laughs> How Dhruva Maharaj left home just as Lord Chaitanya was about to leave home. But the great blessings that that offered to his mother. <coughs> Sachi Mata was crying, Oh Goranga, how will I live without seeing your beautiful lotus like eyes? Your teeth that are like jasmine flowers. Your beautiful moonlight golden face, your wonderful hair that is circling your face, your speech, which is so sweet and brings ecstasy to everyone's hearts, your walk, which is like the gait of an elephant. Please don't go. I cannot live without you. You have Nityananda and Gadadhar and Srivas and you love doing kirtan with them. Just stay here and not leave and do kirtan with your friends. They love you. Your father, he died and went to La Punta. Your brother, Vishwarup, he left home and I never heard from him again. You're all that I have left. I have nothing else. If you leave me, I will die. You have descended into this world to teach religious principles. What kind of religious principle is it to kill your own mother? Is this what you have come to teach the world? Stay. Nityananda wants you to stay. Everyone wants you to stay. And she wept bitterly. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then Nimai. He was very deeply emotional as he, as he told his mother that. I can never be separated from you. You are my mother birth after birth after birth. You were Prishni and I became your son, Prishni Garba. You were Aditi and I became your son, Vamanadev. As Devahuti, I was Kapiladev. You were my mother, Koshalya, when I took the incarnation of Sri Ram. You were Devaki and Yashoda, and I became your son, Krishna. And now in this world, you are Bhumi Devi. And Bhumi Devi gives birth to my form of the Holy Deity, the Archanukra. And you have appeared, my mother as people's tongues. And from you in the form of a tongue, I take my birth whenever my devotees chant my holy name. Two hours left of the night, 
Lord Chaitanya left his room, Krishna Priya was there, Gadadhar and Hadidas were close by. And all alone, he walked toward the door. But Sachi Devi, while the whole world was sleeping, she felt in her heart that he was going to leave that night. She stood at the door all night long, weeping. In the most pitiful condition. The Riva of the Lord is absolute. Sachi Mata's grief was absolute. But because it was absolute, it was a type of ecstasy. Deepest ecstasy. Lord Chaitanya, in order to reach the door, he had to pass Sachi Devi. He bowed to her. He sat down and spoke to her. And I owe you everything. You raised me, you gave me life in this world. I never had any happiness in my life that wasn't because of you. He expressed his love, he expressed his gratitude so, so deeply from his heart to his mother. But he had his mission to bring Krishna consciousness and the holy name to the whole world. And after speaking sweet words, his body was raised by you and I cannot repay you even in millions and millions and millions of births. And he bowed down and took the dust of his feet of his mother, circumambulated her, and left forever. Satyamata stood there as motionless as a statue. When the sun rose, the devotees took their baths and all came to greet Lord Chaitanya like every other day. It's the happiest time of, the, of, of their lives to, to see the Mahaprabhu. It's like Mangalarchi for the first time of the day. And they saw something that struck them. Sachi Dev was standing outside the house, motionless like a statue. The only movement was incessant tears pouring like rivers from her eyes. They asked her, what, what is happening? Why are you outside? Why are you not inside? And where is Nimai? Garlands and 
golden garments. He had the drab, coping up a sannyasi. He left tears. And here is the best jewel of all sannyasis, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who came to this world, Krishna, in the role of a devotee, to teach us how to be a devotee. When we read these stories or hear them, we shouldn't think, well, the Lord does that, but that's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us what we're supposed to do. But we have to understand, you know, through guru and sadhus, how to apply it, of course. But the principle, the spirit, must be taken very seriously. Lord Chaitanya, as a great sannyasi, offered his prostrated obeisances to the feet of his mother, again and again and again. <laughs> Sachi Devi took this great sannyasi in her arms and put him on her lap. He's sitting on her lap. We see paintings of Krishna on the lap of Yashoda. This would be an interesting painting. <laughs> and she embraced him. And right in front of the devotees, Again and again, she kissed his face. But she couldn't see him because tears were flooding her eyes. But she could tell that that beautiful hair was all gone. And Lord Chaitanya actually Sachimata spoke to him that Vishwarup left me and I never saw him again. Please don't do that to me or I will die. And the Lord offered his prayers to his mother. Again, he said, this body is your property. You gave me birth. You protected me, you maintained me through all situations. I owe you everything. I can never obey you millions of births. Therefore, wherever you tell me to be and whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. Sachimata requested Lord Chaitanya, you are wishing to go to Vrindavan? The same Krishna that lives in Vrindavan is in Puri as Jagannath. But Jagannath is close to Namadvi. They are like two rooms in the same house. If you go to live in Puri, I will get news of your beautiful pastime. Although Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's great yearning was to go to Vrindavan just to show appreciation and gratitude to his mother who made his residence in Jagannath Puri. One day, Damodar Pandit came from Jagannath Puri. I'm sorry. Our pundit came from Nadavi, where he was living in Sashi. He came back to Puri. The Lord Chaitanya asked, How was my mother Sachi Devi's devotion? Damodar pundit became very angry. He said, Why are you asking that question? You should already know whatever devotion you have has come from your mother, and you're asking how her devotion is. <laughs> She is totally absorbed in Krishna day and night, and because of what she's given you and her love, you are a great devotee of Krishna. Why do you even ask this question? And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was ecstatic to hear Damodar Pandit's chastisement. <laughs> he said, Yes, this is true. 
Whatever devotion I have for Krishna, I have received from my mother. Whatever good qualities I have, I have received from my mother. And even in millions of kalpas, I can never repay her. And Vrindavan Das Thakur explains that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke these words because he wanted to reveal to the world the priceless gift of devotion. And he also wanted to show his appreciation and his gratitude to his devotees. In this case, his mother. Yes, this A very, very deep and significant part of Ramayan is when Ram Chandra was about to leave home. And he had to speak to Kosalga, his mother. She was all ecstatic that this morning Ram is going to be coronated as the Prince Regent of Ayodhya. And all the preparations were being made and there were people singing songs and dancing and everything was decorated so beautifully and Koshanya was the happiest person in the world because her beloved Ram was going to be taking this most auspicious position. And Ram came into her room and she was just overbubbling with happiness. And she said, why are you barefoot and why have you come by walking? Why aren't you on the royal chariot? And Ram told her, I will not be I will not be coronated today. I have been banished in exile for the next 14 years. The Lord of the Mother is revealed by Kosalya. She was besides herself, pleading with Ram not to go, begging him, who cares about your father? You <laughs> 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 have no right to make a promise like this. You stay. You stay home. You must stay home. You cannot leave. And that's Lord Chaitanya. When Ram told her, I must do it for the sake of Dharma, for the sake of the world. Rosalia, although her heart was torn into billions and billions and billions of pieces for the sake of her beloved son, she gave, she acted with great composure and she said, yes, my son, you are doing the right thing. Go to the forest and live with dignity and integrity. And she gave him as a mother, although her own heart was torn to pieces, she wanted Ram to leave peace. I mean, to Ram to leave peacefully, thinking that his mother was proud of him. And Lord Ram. When Bharat came to Chitrakoot, he told him, you go back and rule the kingdom. And please take care of my mother, Kosalya. And then he said, and please forgive your old mother, Kaikei, because after all, she is your mother. <laughs> forgive her. Protect her. And nourish her. in Krishna's leela, the sacredness of motherhood. That day at Diwali, when Yashoda Maya was churning butter for Krishna. The original mother was
know that he did, he spoke with realization. <laughs> <laughs> and then to his little Saraswati, he probably cried when Srila Prabhupada was giving lectures.
And then Krishna was crying. Kunti Devi, in her prayer, as she was remembering this, although death personified is afraid of you, you are afraid of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and you, she put this cudgel, this black cosmetic on his eyes, and his tears were mixing with that, and there were black streaks coming up. So beautiful. <laughs> Satyabharat Muni and his Damodarastakum explains the scene to us. His lips, which are red like fresh bimba fruits, are trembling. His, his limbs are quivering. His eyes are weeping. And he's, as he's begging mercy from his mother. I won't do it again, I promise you. Don't do it. She put down the skin. Why? Because you associate with monkeys, you become like a monkey. <laughs> Why you are doing this? She had other chores. And she didn't want Krishna to, to hurt himself. So to protect him, she decided to bind him with a rope. She took a beautiful silk rope that was used for binding calves. While they were milking the mothers. This was very appropriate. She went to put it around his waist, but it was two fingers too small. Like this. She tied more rope, still two fingers. She tied more and more and more and more. The rope was getting bigger, 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 and even bigger. And Krishna's waist didn't grow at all. But however much rope, it was always exactly two fingers too small. Soon other gopis came and brought all the stock of ropes from their house. <laughs> they were all different color ropes. It was a festival of ropes. <laughs> there were hundreds of ropes tied together. And the ropes were bigger than this room. And Krishna's waist was this big. And every time it was exactly Gopis told Yashoda, don't you see, it is not Krishna's destiny to be tied up today. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop this endeavor, there's no, there's no use. And Yashoda Mai, by this time, flowers were falling from her hair, and she was perspiring, her sari was becoming loose, she just kept tying ropes. And she said, no, I have to protect my son, I have to protect my son, I, I, I can't leave him alone. And besides that, I really want to see how many ropes it takes to go <laughs> to his waist. And ultimately, to show the whole world how Krishna agrees to be bound by the rope of his devotee's love, he allowed himself to be bound. He was bound by the waist, by the rope of his mother's love. And in this we find, not only is the Lord grateful to his mother's love, but is conquered by his mother's love. And this Devaki, she went through so many difficulties. Just to give birth to Krishna, she had to go through giving birth to so many little children that were all killed right before her eyes. And she kept giving birth to her. She, she knew she had to give birth to Krishna as her eighth child. And finally, when he was born, he said, Take me out of here. Take me to Goku, Mahabharata. And he left her that night. But as a mother, she fed him the milk from her breast before he left, before Vasudev took him across the jungle. And she, never, she didn't see him again for years. But when he did come back, Krishna expressed 
he had such a gratitude for Devaki and Vasudeva's love. He never went, he didn't go back to Vrindavan for so many years. He stayed with them. And Devaki, Krishna said, I'm so grateful to you. What can I do for you to repay you for your love? And Devaki said, those six little children of yours, those six brothers, they're all dead. Bring them back from the dead. I want to, I want to be with them. And just to reciprocate with his mother's love, Krishna went to Sutala Loka and brought all those children back. By this time, it was many, many years. I guess they were still babies. Dravidha Prabhu could probably give us the details, but he brought them all back. And Yashoda and I, with motherly love, fed each and every one of them the milk from her breast, and all of them got liberated because that milk was Maha Prasad of Krishna. <laughs> and as Trimeda Prabhu chanted this beautiful sloka this morning about the Supreme Mother of Srimati Radharani, in her lila with Krishna, she is the Supreme Lover. But for the conditioned souls in this world, she is the Supreme Mother. And her hand is blessing. And that blessing is the ultimate shelter for all living beings. Srila Prabhupada explained that the motherly love of Srimati Radharani is really the only hope of the devotee. It is the supreme power of, this, of the entire creation. Srila Prabhupada explains that Radharani's love for Krishna is so much, she is Madan Mohan Mohini. Her love conquers Krishna. And in several beautiful lectures, Srila Prabhupada tells that in Vrindavan, people say, Radhe Radhe, Jai Radhe. They call upon Radharani's motherly love for their shelter. Because when a devotee cries out for Radharani's help with sincere devotion as the servant of the servant of her servants, and Srimati Radharani approaches Krishna, and Srila Prabhupada said, she will tell Krishna that this devotee is better than me. Please accept him. And when Srimati Radharani says that, Krishna must accept the devotee. There's a beautiful story in Vrindavan, near Radha Kund. There's a place, Shivakor. How many of you have been there? The story, there's many stories of that place. One particular story tells there was a jackal. Now, among animals, jackals are really considered pretty low. <laughs> They're like the lowest caste of animals. <laughs> Chasing him and beating him. 
And finally the jackal saw a hole in the ground and jumped in the hole in the ground to get shelter from these children. Children are like that sometimes. Especially boys. <laughs> and they think it's fun. <laughs> kids, the jackals in the hall, screaming and crying and shaking and fear, all beaten up and bloody. And the children, they wanted to have more fun. So they got a bunch of wood and straw and put it all around the hole and on top of the hole and lit it on fire. And the jackal inside the hole was under this fire that was blazing and burning and smoking. And the jackal was screaming in agony, desperation. And Sri Matiradharani heard the crying of the jackal. Now, did any of you ever hear the crying of the jackal? It's really an obnoxious sound. <laughs> <laughs>
the authority of the scriptures and the saints explains that the cow is our mother. She gives us milk. And that milk nourishes us when we're helpless throughout our lives, especially as children. The mother the cow only a little bit of her milk, the calf needs. And beyond that, she gives so much more. <coughs> when I used to milk cows here at New Granada, there was a cow named Himavati. And she gave a lot of milk. <coughs> Literally, her milk bag was this high and this wide. And Srila Prabhupada came here. And she was in the stall. And Prabhupada walked behind her and saw her milk bag. And his eyes with Puru Das Prabhu and Shamsudra Prabhu were saying about Prabhupada. And he would become really astounded by something. His eyes went really wide. And he looked at this milk bag. It was gigantic. And then he took his cane and tapped it. <laughs> <laughs> to see how much milk was inside. <laughs> Anyways, I milked her, and she would give 120 pounds of milk a day. Wow. And her calf was only this big. How much milk can the calf drink? You give the if that calf drank all that milk, she would be, she would be, she would be drunk to death. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the model of a cow, by Krishna's arrangement. The calf takes a little and she gives so much to all of us. To nourish our children, to nourish us, the cows, like a mother. And in one beautiful lecture, Srila Prabhupada, he explained that the barometer of the spiritual level of any society is how the cows are being protected and how happy the cows are. You want to actually see what is the spiritual substance of the society. See how happy the cows are. And the cows are happy when they feel protected. And Srila Prabhupada, one of the main reasons he established New Vrindavan was to, was to teach the world the importance of protecting and honoring our mother.
that behind every great man is a woman. <laughs> so who is the woman behind you? <laughs> smoking cigarettes for 20 years, two packs a day. Back in the 50s and 60s, that's what this says. Do <laughs> <laughs> I have permission, permission to finish this story? <laughs> in those days, it was fashionable, it was common, because nobody knew in those days, nobody had the slightest hint that cigarettes were not healthy. Except the cigarette companies, but they didn't. <laughs> smoking two packs of cigarettes every day for 20 years and I coughed and said, your cigarettes are making me sick. That's all I had to say to her after she's praying and worrying and crying while she's at my bedside through my surgery and right at my bed. And she started crying right in front of me and frantically put out her cigarette and said, son, little Richie, <laughs> Never smoke another cigarette again if it hurts you. Aww. And she never touched the cigarette. Again. Steal it 
from her garden, and I give it to her on Mother's Day. <laughs> and she would cry and touch it to her eyes and say, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> Whether you gave her jewelry, whether you gave her a car, or whether you gave her a flower, it didn't matter. She taught me things can never make you happy. Only love can make you happy. And things are only meant to be used as expressions of love. But don't get caught up in the thing. It's the love that matters. And that was very easily adopted to bhakti once I met Sri Mukhova. It's a principle. And how grateful I am for that. And I'll end with one little um, story. Some years ago we had our Pula Yatra. It was usually about two or three Three or four thousand people would come for this. It's four days and it's three times and Harikata. And that year Gorvani Prabhu came. And he was leading incredible kirtans. And the devotees, they were very happy. And at the end, we have a session where everyone is sitting, thousands and thousands of people. It's a closing ceremony. I thank everyone. Who and then I asked if anyone would like to say anything. And Gauravani Prabhu, who already captured everyone's hearts there, by his kirtan, by his personality, he took the microphone and he said, I'm only here because of my mother's love. He said, I went astray when I was a teenager. But my mother always prayed for me. And her prayers brought me back to the path of bhakti. Her prayers empowered me to be what I am today. And he became very emotional. And he made all 3,000 people cry. And he ended by saying, never underestimate the prayers of a mother. On this very special day, we honor and worship all of our mothers. And thank you very much. Thank you.